If you have a Bible there, I would invite you to turn to 2 Timothy. We will eventually get there. I, I warn you ahead of time. Typically, we get into the text fairly quickly in our sermons here at First Baptist, but that will not be the case this morning. We uh, have a lot of ground to cover before we will reach that portion of my message this morning. Today, we, of course, start a new series, five-part series that I have entitled Remembering the Reformation, Gospel, Truth, Reclaimed. October 31st marks the 500th anniversary of the day that Martin Luther nailed his now famous 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church. And while this historic anniversary was, was the impetus for the series, my, my goal is not to spark some new debate uh, or, or, or spark some kind of debate about Catholics and Lutherans and the Reformed or Baptist. I realize that that some might perceive it that way, but that's not the intent. Some might even perceive it as anti-Catholic. That is not at all my aim. Rather, my aim is to, to study the truths that were the core of the Reformation while placing those in their historical and appropriate context. And so some of what I will share from a historic perspective may not be pleasant. You already heard some of that this morning, but history oftentimes is not pleasant. So my prayer is that everyone hearing or, or watching these messages, both in person as well as online, will, will do so with an open Bible and an open heart and ask God to use his word to speak to their hearts. Erwin Lutzer, in his great book about the Reformation, it's entitled Rescuing the Gospel, writes the following, quote, When Martin Luther walked the half mile from his home in Wittenberg to the castle church, he was angry. He was about to nail a list of challenges against certain Catholic teachings to the church door, which also served as a bulletin board in the small town. He intended to spark a debate over the abuses that he believed existed in the church of his day, end quote. Perhaps the most or the worst of the abuses in Luther's mind was the sale of indulgences. After all, Pope Leo X was faced with a financial crisis, and the financial crisis was this. He wanted to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, which his predecessor had started but didn't have the funds to complete. As a matter of fact, Pope Julius had really just barely gotten things started on the gigantic structure, but he died before he'd completed very much of it. At the same time that Pope Leo X was faced with this, this possibility and this desire to build this ginormous basilica, an upstart bishop by the name of Albert of Brandenburg had hatched a plan that would enable Albert to purchase the powerful position of the Archbishop of Mainz and would at the same time fill Rome's coffers enabling Leo to complete St. Peter's. The plan was this. It was the sale of indulgences throughout all of Albert's territory. And in exchange for the flow of cash, Albert would become an archbishop. In simple terms, an indulgence was a means for a person to remove the penalty of sin or sins and even possibly pay for all of their sins by purchasing an indulgence through a priest. A priest who became more of a salesman or a, a vendor than a minister, as you can imagine. And so the priests of the region were trained by Albert himself. They were instructed on how to sell the indulgences, and the prices were set in terms of what it would cost to pay for one sin versus what it would cost to pay for another sin versus what it would cost to pay for all sins. And as you can imagine, some of the people began to calculate how much a particular sin cost and whether then in advance it was worth going ahead and sinning. That's part of human nature, is it not? To really up the ante, one could even buy indulgences for the dead to free them from the fires of purgatory, enabling them to enter heaven. And again, in that book by Erwin Lutzer, he writes the following just to kind of paint the picture of the scene of what it might have been like in, 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 in the area around where Luther ministered. He, he says the following, he writes the following, the most dedicated vendor, that's a priest, Salesman of indulgences was the Dominican friar Johann Tetzel, which actually Tetzel became one of the great rivals and enemies of Luther. When he approached the town, he was met by dignitaries who attended him in solemn procession 
The cross bearing the papal arms preceded him and the Pope's bull, that was an official declaration of the church, the Pope's bull was born aloft on a gold embroidered cushion. The cross was planted in the town square and then the sermon began. It would typically go something like this. Consider the salvation of your souls and those of your departed loved ones. Visit the holy cross erected before you. Listen to the voices of your dear dead relatives and friends beseeching you and say, pity us, pity us. We are in dire torment from which you can redeem us for a mere pittance. Do you not wish to? Open your ears. Hear the father saying to his son, the mother to her daughter, we bore you, nourished you, brought you up, left you our fortunes, and you are so cruel and hard that you are not willing to for so little set us free. Will you let us lie here in flames? Will you delay our promised glory? Typical sermon preached by a typical priest peddling indulgences. And then there was a jingle that was repeated, and it translated from German goes something like this. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs. And that became the repeated phrase of Catholics of the area. The people of Wittenberg who bought these indulgences returned with pardons in their hands. They reported that the cross that Tetzel brought to the town square was of equal value to the cross of Christ. In fact, some people bought indulgences for sins that they had not yet committed but intended to commit. Can you see why Luther was a, or Luther was a little upset? I think Luther was too, but uh, can you see why Luther was a little bit upset? When he found out that the, the poorest of the peasants of his, of his small town had, had spent perhaps all that they had in order to try to free their relatives from purgatory or to get themselves some kind of relief from the guilt of their own sin. And so he went to the Wittenberg church door and nailed the 95 theses where everyone could see them. But little did he know that what he intended to spark a discussion or perhaps a debate over the abuses of the church would lead to what we know today as the Protestant Reformation. And by the way, that's not just dull, dry history. It's so much more important than that. It's so much more important than, than just something that we would relegate to the past. And that's why I've entitled this message series, Remembering the Reformation, Gospel Truth Reclaimed, because that's what was at stake and that's what continues to be at stake today. And so the Protestant Reformation, although we can date it back 500 plus years ago, is, is vitally important in 2017. It's important for at least a couple of reasons. Number one, it's important from a historical perspective. It's important historically. I mean, we've all heard the, the, the phrase, or perhaps even used it, it goes something like this, those who fail to learn from histi history are destined to repeat it. I like what Woody Allen said rather wryly. He put it this way, history repeats itself. It has to. Nobody listens the first time around. True, right? We must learn from history's lessons and really studying history, church history, especially is studying God's history. Someone has put it this way, history is his story. It's the hand of God. It's what God has be, been doing over the course of time and in the context of people's lives. It's his story. And so it's historically important. And the more we understand yesterday, the more we will understand today. And so it's important historically. But it's also important theologically. It's important from a theological perspective. It's important from a biblical belief perspective. You see, the Reformation reclaimed scriptural gospel truth that had fallen prey to tyranny and to tradition. The gospel is and was vital to mankind. It's vital to mankind because the gospel answers questions of eternal consequence. Think about some of the questions that were a part of the debate of the Reformation. What's the basis for what we believe? 
Is it the Bible? Is it the church? Is it tradition? Is it the Pope? Is it councils? Or is it scripture? What is the basis for what we believe? Or a question like, what, what, what must one do or believe to have their sins forgiven and go to heaven? Is that not a, a vitally important question? Questions like, what did Christ's death exactly accomplish? What is the nature and the authority of the church? And why do we exist? All of those were the questions that were being debated as a part of the Reformation. Do you see what's at stake? What was at stake and what still is at stake? Everything. I mean, eternal souls are at stake. If we get those questions wrong, the difference is heaven or hell. That's how important it was. That's how important it is to us today. That's a, if I can put it this way, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. And so a Bible-believing Christian like you and like me, Bible-believing Christians should, should be well-versed in the doctrines of the Reformation because they are the core, the core beliefs of our faith. And I would add to that, it would do us well to know some of the events surrounding the defense and the recovery of those doctrines. Church historians have summarized and, and categorized those core doctrines of the Reformation in these five ways. They refer to them as the five solas. Sola is a Latin word for soul, or solely, or alone, or only. We'll put them in English terms, okay, so don't sweat it. Sola Scriptura, and sola gratia, and sola fide, and sola Christus, and soli Deo gloria. All refer to these five core doctrines of Scripture alone, and grace alone, and faith alone, and Christ alone, and God's glory alone. They're the core of Reformation doctrine, and they're, they're the core of what we believe today as well. You may be wondering, well, why the focus on sola? Why, why the emphasis on soul or, or only? That's important for us to understand, and it'll, that will become more evident as we study through these different ideas and texts. But I want to point out something at the beginning that's very important, and it is this, that the solas not only teach what is true, but they also point out what is false. They also point out error. For something to be sola or soul or only or exclusively true, that's the concept of the sola. It's for something to be exclusively true means that something else must be false, wrong. And so this morning we will look at sola scriptura, scripture alone. And I want you to think about three different ideas in relationship to Scripture alone, sola scriptura, three concepts. The first one is the idea. What exactly do we mean by this? When I say Scripture alone, what, what is the, the, the concept that's being taught by that? First of all, I want to define it, and then I want to delineate it. I want to expand on it and go through the specifics of it. So define the Bible alone is, is the authority for all that we believe and practice. We oftentimes in the Baptist church refer to it as the sole authority for faith and practice. The Bible is the sole authority for faith and practice. So what we believe, our, our doctrine, and then how we live. And again, alone disqualifies the rivals. Dis, it disqualifies the additions. In other words, you can't say, well, we base our faith on the Bible and... If you truly believe sola scriptura, if you truly believe scripture alone, it has to be scripture all by itself. And of course, that was the problem in the day, age of Luther and the other reformers, in that the church had taken a stance that was not sola scriptura. It was the opposite. And so sola scriptura says, no, it's not traditions, it's not a pope, it's not councils. And that's where the reformers went head to head with the church of the day. And, and even the church of the day, the, the church of the day, in response to the reformers, they even clarified that this is what they believed that was the opposite. The Council of Trent, which occurred in 1565, they made the following declaration, and I quote from their own writers, quote, I shall never accept nor interpret it, referring to the Bible, 
I shall never accept nor interpret it otherwise than in accordance with the unanimous consent of the fathers. End quote. So what does that mean? The only way to interpret the Bible is with what the church tells you. In other words, the, the authority is not in the scripture itself. The authority is vested in the church. It's what the church says that matters. And so the church of the day taught that while the Bible was authoritative, and it teaches it today, that it's subject to the interpretation of the church, putting the pope and the councils and the traditions of the church over the Bible, superior to the Bible, authoritative over the Bible. And so that ultimately the church becomes the authority rather than the scripture. And so you understand the definition. Let's, let's think about that in terms of it being delineated, the specifics, the corollary concepts then that fit with that in terms of, is this what the Bible teaches? How do we, how do we put this all together? So notice scripture or, or the delineation, the idea of scripture alone delineated four corollary concepts. The first one is this, that scripture is God's inspired word. And finally, we're to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I hope that you have a copy of the Bible open in front of you because this is important. Notice what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 specifically states. It says this. It says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. More literally, it is God-breathed. It's from the very mouth of God himself. God is the source of the Bible. God is the source of Scripture. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's important for us to understand that the Bible comes from the mouth of God, that, that it is indeed God's word. It carries divine authority. And it's the source of everything we need spiritually. That's what he goes on to describe here in the remaining portion of verse 16 in terms of correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible has authority, is the authority, because the Bible is God's inspired word. It's God's word. So Scripture is, in, is, the, is God's inspired word. Secondly, Scripture then is also fallible, or infallible, excuse me. It's infallible. That's an important distinction. Obviously, your pastor's not infallible, right? It's infallible. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Thy word is truth. Sanctify them by thy truth. If you turn with me to, for a few moments to 2 Peter, you'll notice in some important verses that speak of this too in terms of how we receive the scriptures and the end result of that being the, the perfect word of God. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, it, it describes how it is that God gave us this perfect word of truth infallible word of God and how it cannot fail. It's incapable of teaching any kind of error. 2 Peter 1, 19 puts it this way, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation, which by the way, I'm going to pause there for a second because the Roman Catholic Church misuses this verse, okay? They would use this verse to say, see, there you go. It's of no private interpretation. That's not what the verse is saying in terms of my personal interpretation of what the Bible teaches. What it's saying is this, that when the Bible was give, being given to us, the prophecy of Scripture, when God was, was revealing his word to those who recorded his word, it wasn't their private interpretation that mattered, it wasn't their thoughts that mattered. What mattered was God was superseding and enabling them to record perfectly what he wanted in his word. So this private interpretation is not a matter of you sitting there today interpreting the Bible for yourself. That's not what it's being spoken of here. What's being spoken of here is the fact that God divinely was enabling those who recorded the words of Scripture to perfectly, infallibly record his word. And that, of course, is described for us in how that happened. 
Verse 21, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were what? Moved by or carried along by the Holy Spirit. So God describes for us how he gave us his perfect word that we continue to preach and teach and study today. And so scripture is infallible. It's incapable of teaching any kind of error because it is God's word. And this again is significant because the term infallibility by the Roman Catholic Church has been applied to the Pope. When he speaks at cathedra on matters of faith and morals, he speaks, they would teach, he speaks infallibly. You see the authority conflict there between that? Which is it? Is it a man that is infallible or is it God's word that is infallible? To believe sola scriptura is to believe the Bible is infallible, not a person, not a council, not a church. Scripture is infallible. Thirdly, Scripture is sufficient. If you'll turn to 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, just to back a page or two in your Bible, you'll notice what, what it says there in terms of the sufficiency of scriptures when it when it puts it this way in second peter 1 3 as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness how, how would you categorize our lives it's it's all there right in, in terms of everything related to life and to godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been given or by which has been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so he says, you have everything you need for life and godliness, and then he follows up with what that is. It's the great and, and precious promises of God's word. So the Bible has the answers. The Bible is sufficient. Sadly, even today, Christians run a lot of other places other than the scripture to find the solutions to life's problems. That really is... In, in inadequate faith in the, in the sufficiency of Scripture. Scripture is sufficient. And then finally, Scripture is clear. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. If you've ever worked in Awana or been a part of our Awana ministry, you should know this verse right off the top of your head, should you not? It's the theme verse of our children's ministry, 2 Timothy 2.15. The Bible puts it this way, study or be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. And then it's this next phrase I want us to focus on. It's, it says this, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a description of interpreting the Bible. And what it's saying there is that, that God intended it for, for you, God intended it for me to be able to interpret the Bible. In other words, somebody else doesn't have to tell us how to interpret the Bible. God specifically says that we're supposed to be diligent, present ourselves as approved workmen unto God, workmen who needs not to be ashamed because we are rightly dividing the word of truth. So the average person in the pew can understand the scriptures. And again, that may just seem like, well, no, duh. <laughs> but that wasn't a part of the culture of the day of the Reformation era, and it's still not a part of some today. The Bible can be interpreted by the average person. I like the way one person put it about the scriptures when they said the following, in the Bible, the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. Don't you like that? In the Bible, the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. And so we can interpret the Bible. And the best way to interpret the Bible, of course, is with the Bible. Compare Scripture with Scripture. And one of the intentions of a Bible study ought to be compare the comparison of Scripture to rightly interpret what the Bible says. And so the clear texts help us inter interpret the unclear text. That's one of those basics of Bible interpretation and Bible study. If something is confusing in what you read in the Bible, look at all the other cross-references of verses that speak on the same topic and under come to understand that text that's difficult with the texts that are plain and clear. The plain things are the main things. I love the way Luther put it in reference to this clarity of Scripture argument. He said, quote, a simple layman armed with the Scripture is to be believed above a pope or a council without it. 
a simple layman with, armed with scriptures to be believed above a pope or a council without it. And when his German New Testament was printed in 1522, Luther was ecstatic that people, quote, might seize and taste the pure, clear word of God itself and hold to it, end quote. And of course, this flew in the face of the church that taught that nobody could interpret the Bible for themselves. The church had to do that for them. So the Bible alone is the authority for all that we believe and do because it's God's holy word and it is infallible and sufficient for all that we need spiritually. And thankfully, we can clearly interpret it without being told how to do so. Aren't you thankful for the, for the, for the sola scriptura, for the authority of God's word this morning? The idea of scripture alone. Then secondly, the importance of scripture alone. You see, Scripture alone was the, was the bedrock and is the bedrock of all doctrine. In other words, if, if you don't believe Scripture alone, then you can come up with all kinds of other ideas in terms of what to believe. And so it's the bedrock of, of all Bible doctrine, but Sola Scriptura was also the fountainhead of the Reformation. It's really what sparked the whole thing. And I want us to back up a little bit before Martin Luther just to get an idea from a historical perspective of how that was true because 170 years before Luther's 95 Theses, a man by the name of John Wycliffe had a radical idea. Although an Oxford scholar, Wycliffe's radical idea was this, that the common man should be able to read the Bible for himself. Or if he was illiterate, which was very common in the day, he should at least have someone read it to him. And at the time, what few copies there were of the Bible, of course, this was before the printing press, were in Latin, which the average person was not able to read. And so Wycliffe was convinced that if the common people had a Bible in their own language, the gospel would be rediscovered. He would have thought that such ideas would have been welcomed by the church, but the fear of the church, the fear of the church was that if people read the Bible for themselves, they would come up with all kinds of different interpretations, and there would be a lot, loss of power on the part of the church. Consequently, Wycliffe was declared a heretic. The church's disapproval, of course, didn't deter him and, and, and those that followed him, and so they began to translate the Bible into English. Remember, the Gutenberg Press had not yet been invented, and so they began to translate the Bible one stroke of a pen or a quill at a time. And so it would take a scribe 10 months of tedious work to translate a new Bible. Can you imagine that? 10 months of long hours, oftentimes in the evening or night under the light of a dull or dim lamp, translating, copying God's word into English. To make matters worse, the church did everything it could to stop them. The church did everything that it could to confiscate, and they burned Wycliffe's Bibles. You can go to England today to some of the places where there, there are historic markers of places where Wycliffe's Bibles were burned. The church offered rewards for anyone who would turn over a Wycliffe Bible so that it could be destroyed. Incredibly, there are still 170 copies of Wycliffe's Bibles available historic to today, historically today existence. Because of Wycliffe's refusal to stop copying the Bible and recant of what they considered heretical views, a death sentence was pronounced on him. The church was not able to, to carry out that death sentence as Wycliffe collapsed after speaking or while speaking and died a few days later on December 28, 1384. Incredibly, 30 years later, the Council of Constance, which was mentioned in our drama this morning, the Council of Constance decided to have Wycliffe's bones dug up. They exhumed his bones and they burned them, and then they threw them into the Swift River. Their superstitious thinking was this, that if his bones were destroyed and thrown into the Swift River, he wouldn't be resurrected. So they wanted to guarantee it. Sorry, that won't work right? 
<laughs> and while Wycliffe's life on earth ended, his legacy did not. His confidence in the word of God was believed by many of his followers. They were derisively referred to as the Lollards. Many of them also lost their lives for translating the Bible and for continuing to stand for sola scriptura. His impact was so significant that he became known as the morning star of the Reformation. His ministry was the first glimmer of hope that the authority of God's word and the availability of God's word could be restored and every person could have access to it. Important. The morning star's light shined brightly, but not just in England. You saw a little bit of this in the drama. Many of Europe's brightest young men went to Oxford to study under Wycliffe. Others began to read about Wycliffe's ideas. One of those greatly impacted by Wycliffe's ideas was a brilliant young priest in Prague by the name of John Huss. Huss caused quite a stir from the pulpit of his Bethlehem chapel as he preached against indulgences and the doctrine of relics, which is a doctrine where you where you would pay to see or touch something that supposedly once belonged to a saint or a martyr and receive some sort of grace or blessing as a result of paying to do so. He preached against those. And to make matters worse, he preached that the Bible, not councils, traditions, or the church, was the authority for faith and practice and that it ought to be available to everyone. Sounds a lot like Wycliffe, does it not? And as a result, he was banned from his pulpit by the Pope and eventually excommunicated by his archbishop. Despite these efforts, growing crowds in Prague would turn out to hear him. And when Pope John XXII issued a papal bull, which is a papal decree, uh, offering full forgiveness of all sins for those who would join his army to defeat the king of Naples, the people of Prague, influenced largely by Huss, publicly burned the decree. They wouldn't have anything of it. That's what they thought of indulgences. But Pope John the Twenty Second fought back. And really, he put the people of Prague to a test. His response was to order all the priests of Prague to not perform any of the sacraments. No baptisms. No mass. No last rites. No marriage. Because the people of Prague still largely believed that the sacraments were the only means of grace and the only way to avoid hell, they turned on Huss and appealed to the Pope to restore the sacraments to Prague. Huss escaped Prague, but was eventually tried, and as you had depicted before you this morning in the drama, burned at the stake. He was convicted of sola scriptura, really. He was convinced of it as well. Here's before his death. He said, I have said that I would not for a chapel of gold recede from the truth. I know that the truth stands and is mighty forever and abides eternally. As those who would execute him were preparing the fire for his death, Huss was asked one last time to recant. And he replied, quote, God is my witness that the evidence against me is false. I have never thought nor preached except with the one intention of winning men, if possible, from their sins. In the truth of the gospel I have written, taught, and preached, today I will gladly die, end quote. And as he was being burned, his final prayer was a song that he didn't finish the sight of heaven. I think he finished it in heaven. Perhaps. His song while he was being engulfed in the flames, was, quote, Christ, thou Son of the living God, have mercy on me. In addition, a priest who was witness to Huss's execution reported that before Huss died, he said, as was mentioned in the drama, quote, you can cook this goose, a reference to his, the meaning of his name, you can cook this goose, but within a century, a swan will arise who will prevail, end quote. And a century later, Luther saw himself as the fulfillment of that statement. You see, sola scriptura was the foundation and the fountainhead of the Reformation, but it is also the foundation of all Bible-believing Christianity today. Its importance can't be underestimated. 
so the idea and then the importance and finally I want us to think in terms of the implications and this is where it kind of fits us today in terms of application what does this have to do with you what does this have to do with me 500 years later three things quickly the implications of scripture alone number one scripture alone is what we base our beliefs and our life upon nothing else it's what we base our beliefs it's what we base our our life upon when luther was being tried for for heresy at the at the diet, diet of worms i know worms i know we pronounce it diet of worms okay it had nothing about had nothing to do with uh, eating worms in case you don't know the history of it okay it's the diet of worms and i know that others could pronounce it better than i do he said the following he said quote i am bound by the scriptures i have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot stand, or I cannot, and I will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Did you catch that? My conscience is captive to the word of God. Is yours? Is your life? You see, it's not just a matter of belief, it's also a matter of practice. And the best way to determine your beliefs is to examine your practice. The best way to determine your beliefs is to examine your practice. Is the Bible the authority in your life in terms of faith and practice? Scripture alone is what we base our beliefs and our lives upon. Secondly, Scripture alone is what, is what changes lives. I, I won't have you turn there, but I'll just read it to you very briefly for sake of time. I trust that you are familiar with this powerful verse or these powerful verses that are found in Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12 and 13, the Bible says this, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Where's the power? It's in the Word of God. What changes lives? The Word of God. What builds churches? The Word of God. The Word of God is solely capable of doing the work of God. Great ramifications for our lives, great ramifications for a church. If we can make our church successful in any manner apart from the Word of God, we will not really be successful. Rather, we will fail and possibly not know it. You know, there are churches that are doing that today where, where the focus is on something, and I won't even go into what, okay? But it's on something other than God's word. And they may be drawing a crowd by doing that. But that which builds biblical churches and, and biblical lives is the word of God. That's where the power is. After all, it's the word of God that communicates the gospel through which we're saved. The word of God is clear about our sinfulness and, and the fact that God is a holy God and the fact that we can't get to heaven by our good works. It's clear about the fact that Jesus alone died on the cross and was buried and rose again as the payment for sin and he now offers eternal life to those who will believe and repent. That's the word of God. And when you believe that with all of your heart and trust Christ as your savior, it changes you. Has it changed you? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone to save your soul? Like Huss and Wycliffe and Luther. The Bible changes lives. It saves, it sanctifies. I don't have time to go into the significance of the, the, the life change, but it does all of those things. And so Scripture alone is what changes lives and builds churches. And then finally, Scripture alone then is what can feed your hungry soul we we are filling our lives with so much stuff trying to find happiness and satisfaction from the the trinkets of this world that will never ever satisfy our souls 
And what does 1 Peter 2, 2 say? It says, as newborn babes, like a, like a newborn baby, you desire the, the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Nothing else will satisfy your soul other than God and his word. This week I read a Barna study that said that only 37% of Americans read their Bible one time a week. Only 37%. What, what, and I know you've heard this before, but what if you only ate once a week? And yet a lot of Christians, that's their spiritual diet. Once a week, Sunday morning. And they wonder why they're starving spiritually. The Bible is what feeds a hungry soul. Do you, you realize, and I'll close with this, do you realize that in the 1540s when, the, when it was finally legal in England to translate the Bible into English, they, they, they couldn't make enough copies fast enough? And so you know what they had to do with the Bible in England in the 1540s? They had to chain it to the pillars of the church. You know why they had to chain it to the pillars of the church? Because if they didn't, people would steal it. Because people wanted to listen to or read and, and understand what God's word taught so much that they chained the Bible to the pillars of the church. How does that compare with our hunger for the scriptures today? Scripture alone is what can feed your hungry soul. To say you believe in the soul of scriptura and then to not read your Bible to say you believe in sola scriptura and then not to take advantage of Bible teaching as much as possible, to say you believe in scripture alone and not really be a student of the word is a complete contradiction. To say that you believe in scripture alone is to be someone who can't go a day without it. Is that true of you? Like you would eat regular meals, you enjoy your time in the word of God and feasting upon it. That is what someone who believes in the Scripture alone practices and does. Scripture alone. Scripture alone. The Reformers died for this truth. They became the fountainhead of the Reformation. And while we may never have to die for it, God does call us to live for it and to live by it. Let's pray. Lord God, that is my prayer that we would indeed live for your word and live by your word. I pray today that our passion for the word of God has been kindled.